Okay, so uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come here and speak. Uh, much of what I want to say, I think, is going to be complementary to what Steve has said, where Steve has emphasized the ecological aspects of complex systems and uh, how, how they can be governed. I'm going to do kind of the reverse. I'm going to say, I'm going to give short shrift to certain technical engineering, you know, ecological aspects, and look more at kind of the social science behind uh, uh, these governance uh, governance problems. But in particular, I wanted to maybe just, before I get into my, my formal talk, I wanted to just mention a couple things, given the kinds of questions that Steve got. Uh, if I put on my head as a social scientist, well, let me just step back and say, uh, for about 15 years, I worked in Washington at a what's called a think tank, which is really, for those of you who have not been around that environment much, is a, really a, a non-governmental institution, so it's kind of an NGO, but uh, something but uh, geared toward providing uh, you know uh, suggestions to government for how it can run better. So Brookings is a, is a uh, the Brookings Institution is a uh, independent think tank in Washington with funding that has nothing to do with the government, so it can act autonomously. And after being, being there for 15 years, say it is the case that, that uh, you, you can develop a slightly jaded perspective on, on what, what, what policy is and how policy functions. And uh, in particular, I mean, I think it was the case that um, the few of us there who were doing a little bit more uh, basic research, we came to really see that much of really what passes today is kind of policy, uh, let's say, talk by policymakers in the U.S. at least, oftentimes, can be characterized in the following kind of, you know, one sentence, uh, you know, uh, almost a uh, almost, uh, joke because it's so simple. It's going to be that basically, you know, what, what a policymaker says to you, says, says to the audience, says to the media is, you know, do the right thing. Right? They say, we should have the appropriate level of government debt as opposed to the inappropriate level, right? We should have, we should have the right amount, just, just the right amount of, uh, of uh, you know, unemployment insurance, uh, not higher, not lower. They don't, they don't tell you what the, what the right amount is. They just say it should be the right amount, right? Uh, so to a first approximation, you can say, well, what... Um, what policymakers really uh, do is uh, they rely on experts to tell them what the right numbers are and, and they simply say, do the right thing. Now, from that perspective, I'd like to just, uh, uh, I, like I said, I invite you to think about uh, uh, the, the, thing, the things I'm going to say now from, that, from, a, from a perspective which is a little bit different than what Steve gave, which is Steve was very, Steve was, was very clear that the, with the Green Revolution and other things, it, it has been the case that, that it's been uh, scientists, engineers, even some kind of policy, I characterize them as policy want type people, have oftentimes done the, oftentimes done the following vis-a-vis -vis policy. They've said, look, we're going to provide you policymakers with, you know, the solution, you know, it's green crops, or maybe even a menu of solutions. And now you, the policymaker, your job is to figure out what the right answer is. Which, which is the right decision? How will our country go? And this is a certain kind of framing of, public policy. And I'll say that my PhD on it actually says public policy on it. So I have a, a strong sense of, I think, of what this, uh, uh, maybe we call this kind of like, the, you know, the, the, at least in the U.S. we might call this kind of a, a Nelson Rockefeller sense of public policy versus, there was, a, there was before that there was something called public administration. In fact, a, a man I worked with in graduate school named Herbert Simon, who had a Nobel Prize in economics, his degree actually was in public administration, which is a term that's out of favor now for some reason, talking about public policy. But I will, so let me just say that I'm going to talk today about thinking about governance as a multi-agent system that is composed of many different agents all doing, doing, doing things that they, uh, you know, all, all what's best for themselves. So it invites the following, I think, different interpretation. That interpretation is that we as social scientists, well, I'm a social scientist. If you're a social scientist, you may want to view a policymaker as the object of study. They are the specimens that we engage in, engage with. They are the things that we analyze. Steve analyzes water temples and, uh, and rice paddies and the anthropology behind the people who, who create those things. As a public policy specialist, especially someone working in Washington, I think I just lost the mic, uh, uh, one of the main uh, domains of, of study is, in fact, politicians. And so, uh, and so anyways, what I'm going to talk about today has the flavor of, at least can be interpreted in the following sense. We want to basically put the politicians in the model. I'm not really going to be about just, just saying, here's a menu of options, and you can pick the option and you policymaker. I'm going to say, without the policymaker in the model, you have a poor model. All right? So that, that's going to be one, one take-home message. As mentioned, I I'm, uh, spend most of my time at George Mason University. Uh, next year, I'll be uh, on leave at Oxford, and uh, uh, there's a group of people there who are thinking about this way, thinking about uh, governance and economics from, in, from this perspective. So. Uh, 
Okay, so hopefully this will work. Okay, so what I'll talk about today in the next half hour or so is uh, the idea that we're going to treat governance systems as multiple agent uh, entities. That is, we're going to model the many different uh, human beings, many different actors that are in these systems. Uh, I'll just very quickly go through some empirical literature. I'm going to apologize in advance. This is a slightly academic talk, so that many of you are not academics, but it's going to just give you some connections to what exists in the literature. And then I'm going to talk about an explicit uh, way that we use complex systems ideas through an agent-based computing uh, approach. Now, the agent-based computing is what I do for a living. So uh, this is uh, kind of uh, going to be an overview of, of research that my, my research group has, has accomplished. Uh, and the, the overall kind of big picture here, maybe one uh, take-home message or one kind of summary way to think about this is that how can we evolve? How can we use uh, complex systems tools to evolve better governance structures? And that, that's going to be uh, uh, some, something that comes out of here. Now, happily, I think between the, the first talk by Mr. Ho and now Steve's talk, I can go quickly through some of this, uh, this terminology, which may be novel for some of you. Uh, the idea of emergence. Here, we're, I'm going to really mean this in a very kind of uh, very specific way, that we're going to really think about kind of what does the macroscopic level look like when individual agents, individual people are doing certain things. Okay, now, there can emerge different kinds of uh, macroscopic properties, depending on what, what the what, what the individual agents are doing, but also based on the history of the system. And we'll see how, how, that, how that arises. Now, agent-based computing is simply a way to study uh, uh, these kinds of emergent phenomena by basically uh, representing the individual agents and then having, having the computer march through how the <coughs> rules play out and seeing what, seeing what emerges. So in this sense, we use, in the words of uh, at Santa Fe, Steve and I we had a colleague, uh, a very uh, fertile mind, uh, Chris Langston, he called this uh, agent modeling as a macroscope. That is, uh, it's a way to go from the micro level to the macro. And you can, you know, you, uh, you couldn't see the rings of Saturn without a, without a, without a, a telescope. It turns out, and the human eye can't see those, but uh, but you can with a telescope. Certain kinds of uh, social macroscopic properties can't be seen uh, without some kind of large scale rapid simulation approach. So this is, I think, the, uh, the novelty of uh, of this. Uh, the, of this is where, where computing, as John has mentioned, really helps uh, helps to make progress here. What we're going to see, and kind of in following on what Steve has described as non-equilibrium, we're going to see models where there's perpetual adjustment and adaptation at the, at the local level, yet there can be macroscopic stationarity. The macroscopic system can be in quasi-steady state, but the microscopic level is always adjusting, adapting, evolving. And then in this context, then self-governance becomes how can the system itself uh, structure, structure its, uh, its operation such that it is robust, resilient, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how can this? Uh, uh, how can the individuals who are participating uh, organize themselves? I'm going to see examples of this as I go through here. Now, here's where I want to use a, a word of uh, American English, which my experience is it, it, it does not always um, go uh, well beyond North America. It is the idea of a social norm or a convention, uh, something basically uh, something like when a bunch of agents are doing something in. A similar way. They're coordinated. We have a convention. It's conventional to drive on the right side of the road in America, to drive on the left side of the road in England. That's a social norm. Now, it is the case often, it's the case in social science research in some quarters, that we will equate the idea of a social norm or convention to an institution. There's some institutional structure, there's a constitutional structure, there's a governance structure that, that, that is the institution. Now, it is my experience that in some, you know, in some, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, people think of institution more in a brick and mortar way. That is, they want to have a building, a parliament, a, a congress. Or they want to have, have some kind of a physical structure which supports the institution. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure how this will sound to your ears, but I'm going to use these words more or less uh, synonymously today, social norm, convention, institution. And then what we're really talking about in kind of the big picture in a way that has not existed before is a computational version of political economy where we're going to have individual agents represented. These can be the people who are modif who are influenced, uh, who, are, who are in the environment in question, or they can be the policymakers, as I mentioned at the start. In general, they're going to be very heterogeneous. They're not going to be infinitely smart, as was discussed earlier this morning. They're going to be boundedly rational. They're going to have you know, departures from full rationality. They're going to interact directly with, with one another. So now we're going to be in the world of methodological individualism. So those of you who remember your economics 101, this should sound familiar. But one thing that's going to be different from what we do with this kind of approach versus Normal economics is in normal economics, you know, it's a funny thing that in economics we say we represent the individuals. But then how do the individuals act? Well, they interact autonomously without regard for other individuals. Right? The only thing they look at is things like price vectors and interest rates, global variables. They don't actually interact with each other. 
And in fact, in game theory, if, you know, we even know what, what is it. What do we call? Uh, what do we call it when when agents talk to each other ahead of playing the game? Some of you who have it, remember your game theory class, you, you, this is a. Uh, it's thought that all talk that doesn't modify the payoffs is inconsequential. So it's called cheap talk. It, 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 it doesn't matter. So basically, agents don't don't even interact directly in. In, in regular uh, regular economic models, but they are going to interact in our models. And as Steve described, out of equilibrium is very important. We'll see that as we go through here. So the the kind of uh, approach we'll, we'll I get to eventually for the for the methodology of complex systems is we're going to basically just build up some of these software agents, drop them down into some economic environment, and see what they do. Let them interact, spin forward in time. What emerges, and then we'll look at some output statistics. Now the way this works for any particular social phenomenon, in the case of Steve described models of this type for the case of the water temples, you build models that are situated where the agents are doing, you know, water temple-like things, and you see how, see how they interact. I'm going to describe today ways in which agents can be used to model the, uh, the self-governance emergence in, uh, in other kinds of systems besides the ones that Steve, that Steve has described. Okay, so the overall goal, the big picture here is, can we get agents basically to govern themselves? Can they spontaneously figure out how they're going to do this. Now, this can be the case of a, uh, a market. So, uh, laissez-faire markets actually have rules, and anybody who doesn't believe that, uh, it turns out that the rules for the New York Stock Exchange are several hundred pages long. You have to follow, you have to trade with the, in those particular ways. Uh, even free markets have, have lots of rules. Uh, we, we'll, we will build models of economies in which there are firms, and then we'll also build models which we want things like, for example, the Federal Reserve Board to be part of the model, so we'll have to have governance in there. Uh, what is very easy to do today is to model a million agents. In fact, on this little machine I have here, I can, I can run uh, a million agent models in a matter of seconds. What is emerging today is newly feasible, and what I spend most of my waking hours doing these days, really in my research, is building very large-scale models of full economies. So, uh, in fact, the work we'll be doing at Oxford next year is basically trying to reproduce what happened in the financial crisis using models that are one-to-one -one with the actual financial crisis. That is, there are 120 million workers in America, and we'll try to build models of 120 million actual uh, you know, people receiving wages from companies. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is, is how can we get, in these large-scale models, how can we get multi-agent institutions to form spontaneously? And it's hard to do this, and we're at the very uh, early time of no, knowing how to do this. And I think there's an open research question is how to do this properly. I'm going to give you some kind of pre preliminary and kind of uh, early-on results, but we have a lot to, a lot to learn about how to, do, how to do this properly. When we can't get it to happen. For example, in most of my models, in all my models, I can never get the Federal Reserve Board to emerge spontaneously. If, so I, so we, have to, we have to build in the Federal Reserve Board. I would love to know how to get that to happen. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of thing that, we're, we're, that, we're, that that's, uh, remains a research question. Okay. So when it comes to governance institutions, let's take a very specific example that I'll, I'll, I'll work with for, for most of, of my talk to be concrete about it. And the specific example is, is Garrett Hardin's uh, famous framing of the, of the commons in particular, the tragedy of the common, so-called, right? Where there's some, imagine some common uh, grazing land, some common pasture land. Nobody has any property rights to that. So every farmer, every, uh, uh, every uh, you know, uh, herder can put their animals onto that uh, crop land. And Hardin says, well, there's two, great, there's two important problems to that, or there, 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 the important problem in that environment is that, in general, people will put too many cows on the pasture land, in general. So there are two solutions which Hardin describes in his famous paper in Science in 68. One of them basically says, look, a firm could actually ma run the, the commons more efficiently, could run the pasture land more efficiently than this open property rights system where nobody has any property rights. So basically privatize the firm. Okay, that's, that's one solution. Uh, and then how can you get, uh, you know, how can, one immediate question is basically going to be, if in fact you privatize the community uh, pasture land, what happens to those people who were using it before? How do they get compensated? That's an open question. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The other solution that Hardin mentioned is let's nationalize the pasture. Let's just basically make it, make, it, uh, make it communal property and have government now run this from the top down. Uh, and now there, there are, it turns out, you know, well-known reasons why we have states. We have states to keep, uh, keep barbarians at, at our borders, and we have states to promote economic efficiency. It's not obvious that states know very much about how to run commons, how to run pasture land. And I'm going to descri des describe some ex examples where the state has not done a very good job on these, uh, in these domains. The main message I want to talk about today, though, is that, uh, is that both of these, uh, uh, these traditional, these classical solutions that Hardin de described, uh, they have these, these difficult problems, and in general, they can be outperformed by things more akin to what Steve has described today, things in which 
uh, we have self-governance, that is, in which instead of turning over the property to the firm, to a, to a firm, or instead of nationalizing it, what if we have uh, the people who are using the resource figure out how to run it themselves? Now, many times it does not work, but there are well-known examples of where it does work. For example, Steve described that once a month there are meetings at the, at the Water Temple. Well, for every Thursday, uh, uh, for the last 600 and some years, in Valencia, Spain, all of the uh, uh, farmers there who use this Herta irrigation have met outside one Catholic church. Uh, through, uh, you know, Francisco Franco and through world wars and through, uh, through the Inquisition, they still met every Thursday. And they figured out how they're going to divert the weirs to give water to, to people to make that whole thing work. And so here's an example of a, of a long-standing, many hundred-year-old institution for managing uh, irrigation in this one particular region of Spain. There are even longer lived institutions in Switzerland and Japan for, for uh, extracting firewood from, uh, from uh, forests without denuding those forests of firewood. Uh, in particular, in these places that are mentioned here on the screen, uh, there are institutions that, that have lived for almost a thousand years. And they've actually survived uh, through things like, uh, you know, through drought and uh, famine, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we'll describe in a minute what are some features of these things. Uh, it's also the case, uh, and a little closer to home, perhaps here, and uh, that the, in post-World War II Nepal, when Nepal got its independence, uh, there's, a, there's a great example here, I think, of a very uh, uh, clear example of, of what's wrong with Hardin's initial solution. So I'm gonna, there's a lot of details we can go into. I'm going to just kind of paint with a coarse brush here and say, to a first approximation, what happened in the, with Nepalese forests is as follows. Uh, Post-World War, post-independence, the government decided to nationalize a bunch of forests. Okay, and also under pressure from, from the West, from the World Bank, etc., decided to turn some of the forests over to over to uh, to private companies, basically to make it commercial forests. And as all of you know about Nepal, it's a very formidable terrain. But roughly one third of Nepalese forests, in fact, were just left in private community hands, basically because they were just uh, impossible to get big rigs in there to to, to forest them or, or whatever. Uh, just very hard, to, hard country to navigate. Well, the, once again, painting with a coarse, a coarse brush here, the, 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 the summary of Nepalese forests, and some of you may know a lot more about this than I do. I know about this reading from uh, reading the histories, but uh, is that today, in, or in, in this, in the wake of these uh, these management schemes for Nepalese forests, uh, two thirds of the Nepalese forests disappeared. The ones that were nationalized, the ones that were turned over to commercial vendors. The only forests that, that survived uh, were the ones under self-governance, uh, the ones that were run by local municipalities, by, by local tribes and local uh, jurisdictions. And so the lesson here is that Hardin's two solutions are, in fact, not the only way to think about, about these problems of, uh, of growing governance. The leading writer on this topic, at least from the point of view of economics and uh, uh, Western political science, is Eleanor Ostrom, who passed away recently, but who was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple years ago even though a political scientist, an old prize in economics, or as our colleague at, uh, at uh, Santa Fe oftentimes says, the Swedish bank prize uh, for, for economics. So, so uh, Professor Ostrom uh, studied these things as so-called common pool resources. Uh, the fact that um, these, kind, these kinds of uh, institutions, as I described for Japan and Spain, they are not uncommon. They are occasionally long lived but they're oftentimes very fragile. They, they can be overturned with some, uh, by, and maybe not so resilient. But those that are successful are characterized by very clear boundary rules for determining who has access to the common, uh, think fishery, think uh, open water, uh, think those kinds of things. There are rules for governing who gets what in these systems, uh, very, very clear rules. And they're active, this is very important too, they're active forms of monitoring. So for example, one of the great ways this plays out, although in a very uh, uh, passive aggressive way maybe, if we want to think about it, uh, in Japan is, when people gather firewood in, in, in these small mountain villages in Japan, you're required to display the quantity of firewood in front of your house. You have, a, you have a firewood bin in front of your house, and people can see how much firewood you've collected, and that, that limits how much you, you will collect. Uh, now, it is the case that game theorists have often said there should be a lot of things present in, the, in these institutions that would be, have the following character. It should be something like, if in fact you have one stick too many in your Japanese fire bi in your firewood bin, you should be exiled from the village forever. Well, in fact, that doesn't happen. I mean, you don't have such draconian things in, in practice. You have, you have perhaps the threat of these things, but you never have these so-called grim trigger strategies uh, in reality. So uh, it turns out pure game theory is just not that useful in thinking about why these institutions are the way they are. 
What I want to do now is I'm gonna, just to give you a sense that there is some science behind complexity science. It's not just all, it's not just all uh, uh, talk. I'm going to actually go through a little bit of technical stuff, and I apologize in advance if, it's, if, you, haven't, if you haven't done your economics in, in 10 or 20 years, you don't remember this stuff. But uh, he, here's a, here are just some, some uh, formal results. We'll go through this quickly. Uh, it turns out that we mentioned that you can privatize the commons, but already in, in 74, Weitzman proved that if, in fact, there's no side payment made to the, those people who are using the common, then, in fact, it's, it's not a pretty optimal thing to do. That is, imagine all of us in here have access to some 100 hectare commons. We're all putting our, 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 uh, our cows out there. And suddenly, uh, the government says, well, it's better to just turn this over to, uh, to a large firm to run the commons. Well, in fact, it could be more efficient and longer for the firm to run the commons, but unless all of us are compensated somehow for the loss of the commons, then, in fact, it's not going to be I've written here a Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium really just means that um, doing what, everyone doing what's best for themselves uh, is, is, uh, leads to the tragedy of the commons, so-called. So we can't actually do better unless these side payments are made. And these side payments, in fact, are rarely made. So this, this, this is a potential problem. Uh, John Romer is a political economist, a theorist uh, at Yale, and he proved this result about 20 years ago now, that um, there are, in fact, four technical ways in which we can think about having solutions that are actually better than the tragedy of the commons. But it turns out, I'm going to go quickly here, these solutions, and I can give you references a little later on, although these will be in the talk when I, uh, in the slides online, uh, that these solutions actually can't be designed uh, to have everybody you know, kind of pursue what's best for themselves and you end up, in a, end, up, end up in a good result. That is, the theorem, the overall theorem that Romer proved is that there is no efficient mechanism that is going to outperform the tragedy solution that can be implemented as a national equilibrium. That is, there's no way, there's no mechanism that exists that the government can announce we're going to have this new kind of, you know, incentive system. All of you guys are using the commons, but you're overexploiting it. Now that, can we design a new, can we design a new mechanism such that we all follow those new, those new rules and we're all made better off? And the answer is no. That mechanism does not exist mathematically. Now, unfortunately. It turns out this, just, this is a very specific result and applied to the strategy of the commons. It turns out today we know more. Today that, uh, it's widely known that um, uh, there are a variety of theorems which have the basic flavor that uh, uh, mechanism design is hard in many different, in many, for many different kinds of problems. And this is one area where it is hard. Uh, and so I can go into more details later or maybe in the question and answer period. Okay. So what I'm going to do here next is say we, we can't expect to have a beautifully kind of mathematically pure solution to the tragedy of the commons. So can we set up, can we, can we develop something which is going to be kind of, you know, a better, than, a better result than, the, than, the, uh, pure, than this kind of common ownership problem where we all put too many cows on? Uh, so basically, it's we can build a mathematical model of that. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the details unless there's questions about that later, later on. And what we, can, what we end up with is that um, we can get a tragedy of the commons to exist. I'm not, basically, this just shows that as people, as people in, 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 the, in, the, in the environment put, work harder, then we're going to get more uh, effort coming. They're going to get, it's, up, it's better for you to put more cows on, on the environment. And this is just a technical way to say this in economics, that basically uh, when people are doing what's best for themselves, they uh, put too many cows on the, in the environment. And when they do what's best for society, they, they put fewer. So it's just a technical way to say this. So we can invent systems. We can basically invent, using agent computing, we can invent algorithms then that produce good results. And this is just one particular algorithm. I won't go through the details of the limited time I have today. But just to give an example of how this works is that we can say, I'm going to give, go, here are three quick examples where we can show you uh, what happens. Uh, and the first example is that uh, the black line refers to the Nash level where everybody, everybody is uh, doing this stuff best for themselves. And that, notice it has high, high, I think the effort level is number of cows on the environment. So a lot of cows in the environment produces black line low utility versus if a social planner were to figure out how many, or if a firm were to figure out how many cows put on the, in, the, in the past, they would, they would put fewer cows with, and they would get higher utility for everybody uh, there. But what the red line is here is how our decentralized algorithm, agents pursuing uh, their own ends, can produce something which is in between either the perfect outcome or the, or the bad outcome. Now, it turns out we can, we can look at, interpret this thing as basically, uh, when people monitor each other, they basically end up in a situation where uh, we can have these, these results that are better than the bad outcome, not, not quite as good as the, as the perfect outcome. Now, one thing that emerges from this is this is now an example with heterogeneous agents, where the agents are ranked. There are 10 agents here on the commons. They're ranked basically from how much they, from, they have preferences for how much they, they like the, you know, the, 
the milk that comes off the commons or the, or the, the production of the commons. And one of the results that falls out here naturally is that, I'm trying not to bump anything, but it's still, is that, um, is that it basically it's those agents who are the most rapacious, who, who are naturally limited in, their, uh, in, in what they can do on the commons. When that happens, you can, you can get high levels of, of utility, high levels of performance from the overall commons by limiting those who want to be the most rapacious. Anyway, to make a long story, and that produces a different kind of monitoring network, as you can see here. I want to end, though, with a couple of concrete applications, and one of them is uh, one that some of you in the room will know about. So for about five years, I worked on a model of the so-called American Anasazi. These were a group of people who lived, a group of Native Americans who lived uh, pre-Columbus, pre-Columbian, uh, in the American Southwest. They basically grew corn, but they grew corn in a very marginal climate, uh, nine or eight, eight or 9,000 feet above sea level, uh, and uh, uh, in, a, in basically a desert type environment. So uh, it was very hard to, to uh, survive here. And in fact, there was a sudden, uh, even though they, they lived here for a long period of time, they went, there was a sudden demise in the year 1300. So we built a model of this, and uh, using many of the ideas of, of these kinds of uh, commons, uh, there was a fixed amount of, of land you can plant, plant corn on, and how did they allocate that? So just to say, here's a paper on this process that came out of uh, in PNAS, and there was an article by Jared Diamond on this in Science. Uh, so this is an example where the population would eventually grow and collapse. The last example I wanted to mention is that the, another example is we have a new model uh, just, just up and running now of so-called Easter Island, uh, so Rapa Nui uh, uh, in the anthropology uh, uh, in, t uh, in terms of what it's called by the, by the Native Americans. So in this particular model, just to show quickly, um, this particular model, uh, we have the natural landscape, we have of course the famous statue of Easter Island, but we have this kind of high fidelity, full scale model of the entire island. And using this model and using uh, ideas of, uh, this is a case where when the Polynesians uh, landed here, there were great stands of palm trees. And with those palms, they built boats. And with those boats, they harvested tuna. But then uh, it's a relatively small island. And by the time they had uh, denuded the island of all the palm, they could no longer fish for a large, uh, large tuna and other large fish. They end up uh, going through a resource crisis. And at that point, um, things became quite violent on the island and uh, led to the emergence of, uh, of, of tribes that were quite combative. Anyway, to make a long story short, is you can study the spontaneous formation of this thing, of, of these kinds of things, using computing, using agent modeling. Uh, and, uh, and then my summary simply is going to be that um, uh, there are these competing views of governance, top down, bottom up. Self-governance is the, really the, the language of, uh, of complex systems. Uh, and we can use uh, these ideas to build solutions to tragedy, the commons problems. We can apply these today in real world situations. And you know, these, we talked, Peter, uh, Mr. Ho talked about prediction versus uh, explanation. Uh, oftentimes it's hard to do literal prediction with these models because they depend on history, they depend on lots of con contingent things. But what we can do for sure is we can build models that have some, that give us better explanations for why things happen the way they do. Uh, and that can be very useful in and of itself. Thank you. Questions, remarks? Yeah, there I see a hand. Please. I, I promise you this is my last question. Why? <laughs> for the day. No, no, I mean, I, there are more people, so. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. And I just want to mention you some things that you mentioned but didn't go deeply. There's a paper by Carl Schell. He was the editor of Journal of Economic Theory and Pliska. Shell and Pliska is this series of social choice papers where they show that you know, the problems that has pure coordination aspects, endogenous you know, coordination devices are more stable and sustained for long. But the question, wherever there is a conflict between the parties involved, so your dollar means my dollar loss, so you know, not necessarily zero sum game, but you know, some level of conflicts, then external mechanism at times works better than you know, this kind of internally developed what you are calling self-governance. So economists, it's not that they miss this problem, it's just that they know that it's a too difficult problem to get into, so you know, they give these inclinations of these nice equilibrium results, but really didn't pursue too far there because but I think it's, it's that. I'm asking him, I'm making you aware that you know, some of these problems have been already been pointed out in that which can Subax can He's solve. He's defending the economists. Mm -hmm. So please react on that. He's saying <laughs> we economists saw already these problems. 
No, no, I'm not saying we solved already. I'm saying, you know, there is when SUVAX can solve and when SUVAX cannot work, when, you know, that, that has been kind of laid out in economics before. Okay. Thank you. So I think that the, my, my main comment is to say that I think that the, uh, at least when it comes to the tragedy of the commons, of course, this is a problem that's well worked in economics and it's, it's very well understood. But it is the case today that, that it's almost always uh, framed as uh, privatize the commons, put property rights in to solve it, or nationalize the commons, put it under some kind of uh, top-down control. Well, we, and I, I just assert that we have almost no knowledge today of, of, of the full variety of self-governance institutions which might emerge. That is, there could be, I, my feeling is it's kind of like zoology, there could be thousands or millions of different flavors of self-governance institutions that can, that can arise. If nothing else, when we look, when Eleanor Ostrom characterizes the uh, uh, many different, different kinds of institutions which are available just in the US for governing fresh water, that is, there's groundwater somewhere, there is a local community which governs how the groundwater is extracted, utilized, how, how much is used, there is such infinite variety just among, the, among those that I, I don't believe that we have any, any satisfactory theory whatsoever of, of how those things arise. Now, the, I think the main point is just that, yes, it's going to be the case that um, it's harder to manage, uh, manage these things in some cases versus others. And of course, that's true. Okay. But what we don't have is a theory of, of the institutional. No, but there's quite a lot of ideology behind the first uh, the option, nationalize it or make it in the private market. I think it's fair to say. I think it's fair to say that the most economists have not adopted a complex systems approach. Rather, they've said, Look, the world is relatively simple. We're going to keep it, keep it relatively simple. We're going to say, if you solve for equilibrium, notice that a firm does very well on, 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 on managing the commons. Well, you have to make the side payments to make that work out. Or they'll say, well, a different solution is just to have a social planner solve the problem from the top down, and you get a different, a different class of answers. Social planner problem is a nationalized solution. But what we don't know today, we, don't have, we, don't have, we have almost no economic theory whatsoever for how we can have an institution of, say, 25, 50, 100, 10,000 people co-produce an institution which, which self-governs that particular resource. We okay. don't have that theory. OK, please. Hi, uh, Doug Carmichael from INET. Uh, I think looking forward to the possibility of self-governing solutions is terrific. But as I heard your paper, your presentation, you're overlooking that the commons that existed, uh, say, by 1500, had a culture of self-management that actually worked pretty well. And it was the pressure from aristocrats on the land that destroyed the commons, not the farmers themselves. Oh yeah, I'm not making any point about historical commons. I'm just, just saying there are, there are a wide variety of resource problems today that, that are basically commons problems, right? You know, there's a, there's, there are a, a few hundred million gallons of fresh water below some town in Indiana. The community owns it. How do you manage it? That's a, that's, a, that's a commons problem. That has nothing to do with uh, you know, the, the, the English co common laws or something. OK, yes, please. So I, I have Your a feeling that, that we um, yes, are, Peter, how are, you? are, sorry, I'm Peter Slaut, <laughs> from the University of Amsterdam and the Complexity Program, NTU. I have a feeling that, that we are simplifying things too much. Um, so as well as in the talk by, by Steve in your talk, uh, it seems that, that, that you're looking for you know, a set of rules that somehow can guide the process into, uh, like in your case, from, from, you know, from one stable point to another stable point. But, it, but the, the two examples that you both were given about this self-confidence co concept actually is that the individuals there, they constantly adapt to the rules that they have decide, defined themselves. Um, I, I think that's one of the strong, strong things. It's not that they don't just apply rules, but they dynamically change the rules. Um, and, and, uh, and so I, I think we're still looking at things too much in isolation. Uh, the, the reason why they have to adapt to, to, to change the rules is because you know, they are not in isolation. They are connected to all kinds of other things. So my question to you would be, um, can we kind of incorporate this notion of, of evolution of rules um, in the kind of models that you were talking about that, that they would make sense? Because I, if, even though you can observe these two, uh, yes, you know, right. uh, mm -hmm. single single attractors that Steve was seeing. I, I actually believe that that's just a snapshot in time. These things will change right. over time. Okay. So it actually turns out that if if you read Ostrom in particular, I mean, so she has whole chapters about this, Peter. So basically, so the idea that um, she wants to talk about meta rules, and then, then the question becomes, uh, there's a little bit of a public goods problem associated with who makes the meta rules. And in fact, nobody nobody makes them. They, they're simply responses to you know drought or, or famine or something, right? People respond, but. 
We should also differentiate though the idea of, of there can be different, there can be more or less static rules for wide spans, wide, wide uh, blocks of time, yet changing microscopic structure that is, it may be the case that you know, your father has had the land for a long time, your father now passes away, the rules come to you, or the, the, uh, the land comes to you, that would be a slightly different set of rules for you versus your father. So even, even, even though the same, well, there's a slightly different instant, instantiation of the rules for you versus your father, even though it's the same rules. So there's a, there's a question of what is a rule, what's a meta rule? This is an important question in this thing, but so of course they evolved. I will say though, from, from reading Ostrom, she's very clear on this, she, she tracked a thousand but, but years. He said, he said in the, uh, what, your presentation and the previous one, that the, uh, you, you had not brought in enough complexity because you, <laughs> you did not give attention to the, the uh, rule dynamics. Right. And now you're saying, no, 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 no. Well, no. Let me just say, there's a, I think there's a, there's a technical way to say this beyond scope of their current audience is that um, there is a formal theory in game theory, there's a formal theory of, of perturbed games, stochastically perturbed games. We're gonna, we're gonna bounce around between different configurations of the, of the space. And so that, that's the way we model evolution. as basically kind of a, a random process driven by, you know, by noise. So, so okay. there's a formal okay. way to do it. Uh, I'm, oh, uh, please, yes, and that's the last question. Uh, Mono, you go ahead. I, I have a very early oh, okay. <laughs> Very simple question. What's your question, your name? I'm then? Peter Bratton. Yeah. Um, how do you communicate this to the policymakers you described <laughs> earlier? And um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. Okay, okay. so I, I, I want to. No, no, let's say. How do you work I'm with? I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. You, you, you're, you're on a reception with the minister. Uh -huh. <coughs> and he said, the minister is coming to you and he's saying, I heard about the beautiful work you're doing. And I have some uh, local problems there. And I want to have that they solve themselves. I think it's possible that they can solve themselves these problems and they can make a community. And uh, that's, I, I'm not an ideologist, I'm not of the market, and I think that's possible. Please, how to do it? I want to, tell, I want to answer the question with a short joke and say that uh, Jack Goldstone, the physicist at Chicago, uh, eminent physicist, once said that he, he got a call from a, his, his phone rang suddenly in his office and he got a call from a, from a rich donor. It turns out a rich, a rich alumni to, to Chicago, and then the, uh, and the d donor said, um, who am I talking with? And he says, well, this is Professor Goldstone. And then he, she said, well, I will talk with, I want to talk with nobody lower than a dean. And, uh, and, her, and his reaction was, there's nobody lower than a dean. Right? <laughs> uh, so, um, so the point is that uh, it may be the case that if a, if, if, if a policymaker comes to me, I will, I will task one of my subordinates with the issue of, of dealing with the policymaker in the, in the following sense, that uh, uh, I, I want to build policymakers into the model. And that, is, that has probably not come across that, that much not, here. They're not monkeys. No, they're, no, no, they're, no, they're, 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 they're agents, though. They're agents. So I want to have, in fact, it turns out there actually is terminology for this already. So in fact, the Dutch are very good on this. Yeah. Within the Dutch, there's a project recently from the, the Dutch called, the, called FIRMA, Fresh Water Management or something, yeah. in which they actually have the policymakers are agents in the system, and then they call this participatory simulation. Yeah. And this is a very hot topic right now in, in what, we, what I do, mm -hmm. where you actually basically, you have the policymaker play a role yeah. in the model itself. Instead of, instead, of, instead of taking the answer to the policy you're saying, pick A, B, or C off the menu, you say, here, here's a joystick. You, you now play the model and see what you're going to, see okay. how you're going to do. Yeah. This is the answer. Yeah, okay. Okay. Last question there. Yeah. I think, thank you very much for the presentation. I just Your name? Sort of, um, my name is Zhong Wen. I'm from the uh, Urban Redevelopment Authority. Um, I, I sort of have three questions. Um, and and it, it relates, sorry? Three? Three questions, very, very simple questions. Simple que and simple yeah. answers too. Yeah. I hope so. I think the first question is relating to what you shared about an agent-based model. I think that there are some critics, including I think Dave Snowden, who sort of asked the question of whether an agent-based approach, which has been used a lot in, in biology and looking at how molecules and animals interact to see it's the emergent patterns, whether that is directly applicable in social, uh, looking at social economic issues. And that's the I, first question. Yeah, so that's the first question. And I, I think part of that is also looking at saying that in terms of social economic issues, you see a lot of adaptive behaviors. What would be a good approach in terms of incorporating within an agent-based model consideration of these adaptive um, uh, um, behaviors that happen? The second part, I, I think it's really also related to the first question, is saying that even within social science, whether is it in economics, in psychology, in sociology, there is a diversity of views of how a certain relationship actually um, happens. 
and there's no even common agreement whether that relationship is correct or, or wrong. How then do you incorporate this diversity of views into a model where you're trying to consider how socioeconomic patterns and relationships and interactions take place? And I think that the third question sort of also refers to uh, Lansing's earlier... Was this the, s the second question then? Yes, still this is the second question. So the third question is sort of relating to, uh, I think, the Lansing's uh, earlier presentation, which sort of showed that through simulation, you see an outcome happening which relates to the subak. And at least my, my very rudimentary understanding of complexity is saying that from a certain initial state, it could t take place and transform over time to very different outcomes. But in, in that simulation earlier, you were saying that after 10 years, the outcome was similar to what you see today. What were the do, you, do we think that there will be other outcomes that could have happened? I mean, for example, in the Subak case or in a, a other cases, because I, I suppose that is what we refer to as complexity. Okay. Right. So three questions. I can answer them all, all with one answer, I think. And the, the, the answer is going to be that basically, uh, uh, when it comes to agent-based modeling, uh, when it comes to social science modeling, the only way today that we have to include the, the important things that you mentioned, adaptive behavior, heterogeneous, <coughs> heterogeneous understanding of how the world works, et cetera. The only way to put those things into formal models today is with agent-based computing, because we don't know how to do that mathematically. So agent computing is a natural way to, to do that. Now, it is the case, though, that we are at, we are, you know, Steve and I have been around for doing this stuff for only on the order of uh, 15 or 20 years. The, the field is that young. The field's only been around. Chris Langton invented the field 20 years ago. And it's a very young field. There are lots of things that we, do, we don't know how to do properly in it. But I think that those people who can say, after only 20 years of development, that it is not the right way to do social science, those people are not scientists. That, that, that's, a, that's a claim, that, that, that's, not a, uh, that, that's, a, that, that's an assertion, that, that's, that's not a theorem. So your answer is then, he is asking three critical questions, and your, uh, your answer is, don't be so critical now, come back over 20 years. Fair enough, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah. That's right. it, eh? yeah? Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much thank for you. your presentation.